So um, we have um, Kimberly Hone with us today, and uh, give Kimberly a round of applause. It's great to see her. Um, for those who know Damien and Sandra Moon, who were um, you know, got the bus and toured around Australia, this is Sandra's sister. So, so there's a connection <laughs> with our church, which is fantastic. Um, but the reason Kimberly's here, I asked Kimberly to come today because I'm going to talk about the Christian worldview in politics. And um, we have an um, election coming up next year, federal election, and we have a state election coming up next year as well. And more than ever, your vote is going to make a difference in what happens in this country. And so um, I've asked Kimberly to come along. I'm going to share first, and then, um, and then she's going to share with you as well. Um, but as Christians and as the people of God, how do we live under a government that has so vastly changed? I think you'd agree with me that uh, it's not the Australia that we grew up in. You know, governments have changed, um, things have changed. Um, and um, how, how do we, you know, I, I, everything I see that's happening in the world, I like to filter back through the Bible, amen, through the Word of God. Um, because not only does it show us history and what has happened in the past, but it also talks about what's going to happen in the future. So. How do, how do we live under governments that have changed? Can governments go too far? And can they penalise us and put our society into hardship while saying they are saving us? You only have to turn on the news each night and see the heartache, despair and people are under. And quite frankly, we have a huge mental health problem staring us in the face. So um, what I was talking about, even at communion, people that are, you yeah, know, there is such a, a mental health problem. So what does the Bible say about the role of and responsibility of government, our roles as Christians and how we relate to the governments we live in, and should, get, should Christians get into politics? Well, um, I was asked that question in India actually because um, get, um, our friend in, uh, in India, he's actually got into politics and the reason that he did that, and he actually spoke to me before he did that, and um, because it's a very interesting, Christians and politics is a very, very interesting subject. A lot of Christians will say, stay away from politics. You know, that's not where we just need to pray. Um, other people say, no, we need to be a part of politics. Um, both when I was in Africa, in Uganda, and also in India, I was asked that question by people. And my simple answer is, yes, Christians need to be in politics. Because if we're not, then where the people that are in politics are not going to be standing for what we believe in. Amen? And uh, there's, a, there's a very good line that says, um, evil happens because good people do nothing. And so if we say, okay, we're not going to be involved in politics, well, then we're allowing everybody else to have a voice for us. And often people who don't have a Christian worldview. Um, a very good friend of mine, Lyle Shelton, who's actually spoke here before, he said, if you don't engage in politics, politics will engage with you. And I think we've seen that this year more than any other time, is that we're subject to now um, politics and governments. It's actually one of the reasons we're meeting here rather than in the, our church at the moment because of restrictions. And so, um, so the short answer is that I believe that um, we need to have a Christian worldview in politics you know, that is standing up for what we believe, standing up for um, Christian worldview. And I say it that way because that is different than a politician who's a Christian. That's a different story. You can have a politician who is bringing in policies who just says, I'm a Christian, but not necessarily bringing the Christian worldview into politics. Do you understand what I'm saying? And so there is a difference. And you have to really determine that when you're looking at who you're voting for. Don't just vote for a politician who's a Christian, because sometimes I've seen politicians who are Christians who are still putting things through that are anti-Christian, that are not what we stand for. But what we need to have is actually Christians who stand up for a Christian worldview on topics like abortion, on euthanasia and all those different things. Um, because unfortunately, and I'm just going to say it, I, I'm very much saying it plain, I have seen Christian politicians putting through things that are not Christian at all. Putting through, um, supporting euthanasia bills, supporting abortion, things like that. And so... Um, 
you know, you've got to be careful with the Christian tag. I'll never have a, um, a, a trade directory, a Christian cha- trade directory, um, because um, they, I've known Christians that have ripped off people. Because, because people have trusted the fact that they said they're a Christian doesn't necessarily mean that they're walking according to the things of God. And um, I've seen um, non-Christians with better values and morals than Christians at times. And Paul, look, I, I, I don't have an issue with that. Paul actually plays, says it quite plainly that there are three type of people. There is the natural person, the spiritual person, and the carnal person. And a carnal person is a Christian who's given their life to the Lord, but they're living as if they're just living for this world. And so when you understand that, that helps you to, to understand how to navigate that. So I don't have an issue with that, but it does help me to determine things. So I'm going to, um, I'm going to address one of the um, white elephants in the room and it's one of the most abused scriptures that we've had this year and it's Romans 13 verses 1 to 5 about talking about being subject to governing authorities. Now before I do this every time you look at scripture there's a few questions you've got to ask. First of all who wrote it? Second of all who was he writing to? Thirdly, what is the context of what was written? And fourthly, how does the passage fit into all scripture? That's where you can come undone. If you actually, um, <laughs> the problem is if you just take a, a one scripture and don't put it in context, if you don't use a context, if you take the text out of context, you just end up with a con. <laughs> And so every scripture has to be in context, uh, as Paul talks about, the full counsel of God. Amen? So I'm going to read this scripture, and then we're going to bring it into context, and we're going to bring it under those, those four things. So Romans 13, 1 to 5. Let every soul be subject to governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. Then all authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be afraid, unafraid of the authority? Then do what is good, and you will have praise for the same. For he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is God's minister and avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Therefore you must be subject not only because of wrath but also conscious sake. So there are many ministers at the moment saying that, and I, I, why I say that is because I get those phone calls from people in uh, churches, and they're saying, well, you know, you just have to do everything the government tells you because of Romans 13, 1 to 5. And, and people, that means, you know, people have... Uh, yeah, lost their jobs, maybe taken a, a um, experimental drug, drug that they didn't want to take or whatever it is, people are actually doing things that they would not normally do because even a pastor has told them, well, you just have to do what the government says according to the scripture. Oh, I'm just calling it out plain. <laughs> so here's the thing. We've got to look at who was writing it. Well, Paul was writing it. Who was he writing it to? He was writing it to the church in Rome. Okay, what's the context? He was not r- talking about the Roman governors at the time because here's the thing about the Roman governors they were not under the authority of God. If anything, they were killing Christians. And so for him to say, for him to say that um, to um, the Romans, for him to say, well, you need to be under authority of the Roman government, they was basically saying, line yourself up and get killed in Colosseums. Do you think he was saying that? He wasn't saying that. Of course he wasn't saying that. What was he actually saying? He's actually took, now there's different forms of government that we have to understand. We see the word government and we just think about the government of our nation. But there are different forms of government. There is self-government. We have to govern ourselves. We have to, the, the Bible talks a lot about that. Our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit and we should be careful what we bring. The Bible says be careful what you bring in your eye gate and your ear gate. We should govern ourselves according to the word of God. Amen. There is also family government. Now, um, I'm, I'm finding that this scripture is very much aligned to another scripture that has had a lot of abuse, and that is um, Ephesians 5.22, where it says, Wives, submit to your husbands. That, that scripture has had so much abuse to the point of view that there have been 
uh, women who have been in abusive relationships and they've gone to churches and said, oh, what should I do? And they say, the Bible says you must submit to your husband. And some of them have been killed or ended up in domestic violence. Do you think that's what the Word of God is saying? No. As much as it's not saying that, it's not saying that we should submit to a tyrannical government or somebody who's actually going to control you or cause you harm. Amen? So... <laughs> Now, there is church government as well, and I believe a lot of what Paul is talking about here is church government. But I'll tell you why. Because in the verse um, 3, sorry, 4, where it says, For he is God's minister, that's the Greek word uh, diakonos, which we get the word deacon from. <laughs> and it actually means servant. It actually says he's a minister. It's God's minister. And so we know that the Bible talks about being in authority, to um, those in churches. But here's the qualifying thing. Um, it's saying that these, these leaders are subject to God. They've been appointed by God. So just as much as the answer in, in um, Ephesians 5.22, wives submit to your husbands, the, in the context of that scripture, it's actually saying wives submit to a husband, a godly husband who will lay down his life for you as Jesus Christ laid his life down for the church. That's the context. In fact, if you go back a few verses, it says submit to each other. First of all, it says submit to each other. Then it actually talks about wives submitting to their husbands. But it talks about husbands laying down their lives, being like um, Christ is to his bride. That's the qualification. Any wife would submit to a husband who is actually leading a life that, like, and living, living his life like Jesus and treating his wife as Jesus treats the church. No, no wife would have a problem with that. But they do have a problem when it's actually power and control. And so just as much as um, this is not asking us to actually submit to a government that's actually exercising power and control and evil over us. Because otherwise, um, how, would, how would in, um, in Hitler's time, would you use that scripture and say, oh, well, God says we should submit to him? Or especially in, these, in the Romans' time, should we submit to a government that was killing Christians and putting them in coliseums? No, that's not what actually the context of that scripture. Amen? So, um, this word minister is one who executes the commands of another, a master, a servant, an attendant, or a minister. So, and a, a servant of the king and a deacon who by virtue of office assigned to him by the church cares for the poor and has charge of and distributes the money collected for use and a waiter who and one who serves food and drink. See, Jesus said that, um, yeah, he said, I didn't come to judge, I came to serve. And so, you know, who has the ultimate leadership? It's Jesus. And what did he do with his authority? He served. Amen? And so that is, when we're looking at that scripture, it's got to be in the light of that. Actually, um, the, um, the only civil government that actually works properly... Um, so there's, there's obviously civil government as well, which is the government of the nation. And um, so you've got local government, you've got state government, you've got a national government. But the only civil government that works properly is one that is run by people that are ordained by God, that uphold a biblical worldview and see themselves as ministers, deacons, servants, appointed to God to uphold good and punish evil. That's what the scripture is about. Amen? Look at what Jesus, see, he, Jesus said in Matthew 20, verse 25 to 28. Jesus called them to himself and he said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them. Okay, so that's often what we see. In other words, he was saying worldly leaders lorded over people and those who exercise great authority over them. Yet it shall not be among you. But whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to serve, but to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. So if you... Now, you know, we live in a democratic society, so we have a vote. And let me say this to you. You know, every year I put out a, um, a, a spreadsheet to let you know what parties are actually... Um, upholding Christian values, but it goes beyond that. Is that the people that are you're voting for in the low in your local area? You have to ask the question: Do they uphold godly values? Are they going to represent me? Are they not just a 
a politician who's a Christian, but are they going to uphold God, godly values? And I think now coming up in this federal election and the next, there's a lot of smaller parties and there are some that are actually going to uphold those and I think now we have that opportunity to see that coming to our nation. Amen? So, so Jesus showed this that it's not the way to govern to lord it over people but he showed that the correct way to govern is to be a servant and that's why those who work in government are called public servants <laughs> that's their title they're supposed to be public servants so clearly we need godly men and women in every sphere of government people who are personally governed by god families that are governed according to the word of god churches that have ministers that take their role of authority as of god as ordained to serve the people and civil government that has people in it with a christian worldview who have been appointed by god to serve the people not just politicians who are Christians, but a Christian who brings and upholds godly principles into politics. So we've not seen a lot of that in our country. And the reason is, is because the church has stayed out of politics and they've let ungodly men and women rule our nation. That's what's been happening. And, um, you know, last, last um, week when I was talking about uh, the persecuted church, we've seen a, a rise in hatred. In fact, anyone, you know, even um, our, our now um, New South Wales president, as soon as they said he has a faith, they were attacking him. The media was attacking him. And um, I would still say he's a, um, a politician who's a Christian. <laughs> but, um, you know, here's the thing is that there is that, that hatred. And so Christians have s tend to step back out of the fight and also said oh look you know our part is just to play no our part is to stand up our part is to be a part of uh, the political arena and i think now more than ever is a, a good time to do that so so um just before i hand over to kimberly to, um, two areas um as you may know we've we had um fred nile and, and lyle shelton here and i'm actually at the moment the branch manager for the christian democrat party for the tweed area and so where there's a few things just to sort out because the next election is not till state elections not till 2023 um but we're um hoping for um lyle to step into that role and then we'll actually start to and you know the great thing i can tell you about Lyle Shelton is that he has a Christian worldview that he stands up for you know he's he's received a lot of flack constantly but as you know if you followed him he actually stands up for a Christian worldview and so there are going to be so many people that are hungry for that you know unfortunately um, as Christians we've 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 voted for the the two parties and one which we think is more Christian than the other that's actually not working at, at the moment so we need to um, be represented by people who actually stand up for um, so so um, I'll be helping to um, get that going for the next state election um, but for, for the federal election um, Kimberly has actually decided to run for the National Party and Kimberly is a person that has Christian worldviews. In fact, it's already um, butted a few heads already <laughs> because of that. Um, but you know, here's the wonderful thing and I keep coming back to Daniel. Um, you know, when the government at the, at the day said to Daniel, you can't do what you've all, always done and you have to worship this idol and this God, he went home, he threw open his windows and he did what he always did and that is as a Christian he prayed three times and he had people there waiting to attack him and he knew what that meant. For him to do what he'd always done as a Christian meant that he could actually lose his life thrown into the lion's den but he was prepared to do it. Amen? And you know what happened? It changed the nation uh, because you know, the, the king... <laughs> fasted and prayed for Daniel all night he didn't sleep and he actually you can tell when he saw Daniel he said has the God you serve <laughs> saved you I reckon he was at home going Daniel's God you know I know you won't listen to me but listen to him you know you're his servant you know save him and so yeah he was he was fasting and praying all night he changed that man he changed that king and then that king did a decree and got the the, the whole of that nation to actually serve God and so you know yes it may um, you know you know people who are on the and, and please please pray for Kimberly and pray for Lowell Sheldon they, these guys put their life on the line and um, but they do it because they believe in and they're standing up for us amen so I'm going to hand over to Kimberly give to give her a round of applause as she comes to share Thank you very much. wow 
um, this is the under house church, not the underground church, hey? <laughs> How good is it to just feel the breeze and hear the birds during worship? I just love that. And I don't know if you noticed, they stopped singing when <laughs> Brenda stopped singing. <laughs> Um, so just a quick little background about who I am. Um, my husband and I have been running a business slash ministry called Business Greenhouse for about um, 13 years. And what that means is we've been teaching people in business, Christians in business, how to not only just run your business and be incredibly successful but how to use your business to impact your community and how to use your influence to impact your community and ultimately bring God's kingdom to earth and so we've been doing that for a long time and in amongst all of that we were also hosting kingdom business summits I don't know if, if any of you have heard that before but these were um, really big events that we held in five different states across the country and um, we've not been able to hold any of them since um, all the lockdowns and the, the restrictions on travel. Um, but we, the Gold Coast was our biggest one. We would get to um, about 650, I think, was our biggest one that we ever held um, of Christian entrepreneurs that would gather together and inspire one another. And um, the common thing that I always found was that um, Christians in business who wanted to impact their world often fell alone. And so when they would come to a summit and find other Christians in the same boat, quite literally, um, that was really inspiring and exciting for them. So we ended up deciding to take our message to the road and we travelled Australia for three years um, with a little stopover gap in the middle and we took our message to the road and um, I'm not sure if I was a bit crazy at the time because our youngest third daughter was only 10 weeks old um, and um, we moved on average about every four days and we, um, Wes, my husband, would speak and then I would follow up and pray for people who wanted prayer at the end. So it was a very big taxing ministry journey. And then in our last month of on the road, we uh, stayed at the Kingscliff Caravan Park and we thought, well, isn't this amazing? Isn't this area beautiful? And we've not left. <laughs> so we, we moved here at the end of 2018. And prior to hitting the road, I was a volunteer for the Family First Party in Queensland and I was on the board of directors there and volunteered um, for about seven years. And I worked closely with Australian Christian Lobby, uh, with Wendy Francis and um, other organisations. And, and we worked really hard on um, lots of social issues like um, the sexualisation of children in the media, um, the exploitation of women, and, and lots of other social things um, with a focus on family. And so that was my, my background, just to let you know who I am. But now I'm running for the national party and um, like Rob said yes I have um, caused a bit of a stir already and I myself have someone who can't sleep <laughs> um, trying to he's not a Christian and he's he can't sleep because he wants me to um, get in and I'm, and I'm having these massive blocks at the moment in our formalization processes um, but you know what uh, I'm just there to represent, hey? And that's what we are all to do, regardless of, of our workplace or what we do or who we are um, from Monday to Saturday. We're there to just represent. You know, church life, I hope, no more, is about th what we do on Sunday. I hope that we take church life into our entire week, Monday right through to Sunday. Sunday should be your recharge, and then you go hard on Monday. So... Um, it's very really interesting to see what's taking place in our state at the moment. And when I was working for Family First, I found it very hard to engage Christians and very hard to engage churches in politics in general. And I think the tide has changed. And I think one of the turning points for that was the, the gay marriage debate. And that was a really big wake up call for a lot of churches and a lot of Christians. And so I think people are becoming more and more engaged um, in the arena, but probably don't know how. Um, how to have their voice heard. So the ultimate goal for me is, just like my husband and I have done with business, I want to bring God's kingdom to the political arena and I want God's kingdom to penetrate the political mountain. So um, I just want to let you know a practical thing that's happening at the moment. So um, the next election, there'll be a lot of discussion about the euthanasia bill, which has very nicely been renamed the assisted dying bill. 
Now, I was in a meeting just this week with a bunch of political people and I was the only one in that meeting of about 11 or 12 people who um, is not for that bill. And, and I was sitting in, in a room with people who were um, probably over the age of 70, all of them, and probably more closely I would have thought related to that bill than myself. And they themselves couldn't see anything wrong with that. Now, Jeff um, Provost was also in that meeting and he was able to outline that bill to us, which is great. And I want to tell you how this conversation um, goes when you're talking about a bill. So first of all, we, we get the information about the bill. Now, the bill will be changed um, probably about 150 times before it gets processed and actually passes as law. Now, it's been going through Parliament for about two to three years and it lost in the most recent debate by only one vote here in the state of New South Wales. Now, it has about 20 or 23 co-signatures already, so politicians who are, uh, who are ready to agree with that bill and push that forward. There are 93 members in the lower house, so it has to get 47 OKs. The upper house, uh, if that bill passes through the lower house, it will just fly through the upper house. There will be no further debate. And the upper house is supposed to be your second place of healthy debate. It won't get that. Now, the National Party has allowed a free vote. So it's no longer called a conscious vote anymore, where you get to vote whatever you like. You don't have to tow the party line. They call it a free vote. Um, now, jokingly, in that meeting, someone said, is that because politicians don't have consciousness anymore? <laughs> and that was very funny. <laughs> and very makes you think. Uh, now, at the moment, in the public, 100 people from the public have co come to Jeff Provis's office. 100 people, roughly. He said 100, 110 people. And have told him they are for the bill. Then he said, I've had a handful of religious leaders, one of them being Rob. Okay? That's it. And that alarms me. And I think one of the things that we forget is that um, as the body of Christ, we can't put too much pressure or reliance on our leaders to be our voice. We must be the voice. We are all the body of Christ. And leadership falls upon all of us. And so I would like to see all Christians rise up and be that voice in that political space. What does that mean? You just get on the phone, you email, and you ring Jeff, and you let him know why you're not for it. Now, Jeff himself is um, very good at making sure he has heard the public and he doesn't have a strong stance on this either way. He will do what his constituents want. So there you have it. And a lot of positions, uh, p politicians sit in that place and that's how they view their decision-making processes. Now, Queensland uh, already has passed this bill in um, September and it came into effect in January. Now, it included the border residents of Tweed. So you can cross the border to die, but you can't cross the border to visit your family members at the moment. Isn't that ironic? Now, New South Wales, the new bill that is currently being debated, you need uh, two GPs to agree that, um, that you can go forward with this euthanasia. And only one of them you must visit in person. The other one is just a phone call. Now, one of my major concerns is mental health at the moment. Mental health is through the roof. What does that mean now when we start to see hundreds of people with mental health who see there's no point in living anymore, I want to exit, and all they have to do is have a phone call with a GP and visit a GP, and that's their exit strategy from the world. There is safeguards in this bill for those that are wealthy. <laughs> so if you have a wealthy aunt and you want to knock her off so that you can get her inheritance, this is, how, this, is, this is the stuff they're discussing. There's safeguards for that. And I would trust whether they are safe enough. And uh, so these are all the things that we don't think about. You know, people don't think about when they think, oh, they just want to end someone's suffering. 
And again, the, the renaming assisted dying bill sounds nice. You're assisting someone in their suffering. That's not what we're discussing here. And as Christians, we need to discern what, when we, when we change law, what comes next? What are we doing next? What is the, what is the, the, the laws that will have to be changed after that? How do we protect someone's wealth? Now here's a question, and this is um, really closely in line with what Rob was, was sharing. Does law recreate culture, or does culture recreate law? So what, am I, what I'm asking is, it's like the chicken and the egg question. If we fight really hard on setting laws in place, does that really change culture, or does impacting culture change laws? This is a really, really important question. Now, you can um, argue, and a lot of people argue this, that you can't legislate morals. A lot of people say this. You can't legislate morals. But in reality, that's all that law is. It's legislation that is creating legally binding ways of living that citizens are expected to abide by with rewards or puni punishments attached. But whose morals are we basing the laws on? So how do we respond when we, when we see this stuff taking place? And now, right now, we're right in the thick of, of all of those things. That's what brings, what brings God's kingdom to earth. That's another question we should be asking. How do we bring God's kingdom into this political arena? How do we change the mountain radically from the inside out, not from the outside in? We don't just fight as Christians for liberties and for freedoms, with an S. We fight, we fight for freedom, the true freedom that we know. And the only person that brings true freedom into any community, any family, any individual, any nation, is Jesus Christ, the pure essence of the gospel. True freedom that transcends your circumstances that surpasses all understanding, that caused Paul and Silas to sing when they were in prison. God's laws don't liberta liberate people. Sorry, good laws don't liberate people. Jesus does. We have to focus on that. When vi village life had ceased to exist, Deborah spoke wisdom and became an uncertified judge, mediator, counsellor under the shade of a tree. She didn't need a corporate building, a big courthouse. When the current king and kingdom was so far from God, Samuel stopped whinging about the current king and anointed a new one. When genocide was about to be committed, Esther appealed for favour in the king's eyes and saved people, lots of them, by thousands. And I just want to add there, they still had to fight. They weren't just instantly free, they still had to fight. When Israel was enslaved and daily, abu daily abused um, all day long under horrendous conditions, Moses at first ran away. But then he returned with boldness and declared the coming plagues. When the king was needing dream interpretation, Joseph became an advisor. When no prayer was allowed in the kingdom, Daniel prayed where everyone could see. In the New Testament, Paul's ultimate mission, regardless of all the churches that he had impacted, his ultimate mission, do we all know, was to make it to Rome and talk to Caesar. If we want law to impact culture, there is only one type of law that can do that, and that is the law that is written upon our hearts. How does it get imprinted on our hearts? Through the pure transformation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I just want to say this story when I, um, I did a mission trip years ago in my early 20s and um, on part of that trip I just wanted to go and visit the schools and you know do some teaching of English and uh, the leader of the, the trip uh, didn't roster me on that instead she sent me to a all-male African prison to preach and I thought what on earth I think I was about 21 what on earth is a white 21 year old female going to share to a bunch of these African um, convicted criminals. And um, as I prayed and asked the Lord, the Lord showed me, you will speak on freedom. Sorry, I get emotional. You will speak on freedom of the mind. And so at that prison, 
I did. And I spoke about the difference between um, knowing of God and knowing God. And that you could be free and out of this prison but still captive in your mind. And that Jesus brought true freedom. And at the end of that message, they all raised their hands. Every single one of them. There was about 80 people. And it all came forward to prayer. And I was like... Uh, totally overwhelmed you know how do I what do I do now <laughs> not knowing what to do and they all wanted to receive they were in prison but they wanted to receive this true freedom you know and who am I to be able to relate to them on any level you know but that message meant something to them now for a long time we've had separation of church and state as Rob talked about but that was originally set up to protect the church. But now what we've got is, is the opposite. It's protecting the government from influence of the church. So not only should Christians be involved in government, but we are the standard. We are the way. I'm talking about all of us, not me. All of us. We are the way. Now, the, the Bible says that Jesus carries the authority of government upon his shoulders. And we represent Jesus. So we carry that authority too upon our shoulders. It's our responsibility. Now, what do we do now? Well, as Rob also talked about, the woman at the well, that's been on my heart so much last, lately. So in our times of struggles at the moment when we don't know where the government um, is sort of going to lead us next, we have to go back to the well. We have to go back to the living waters. And if you remember the time when um, Jesus was talking to the Samaritan woman at the well, he says to her, you can have water in this dry desert, but I'll give you living waters. And he, he sort of starts to transform her mind on what is it that we truly need. And if your well has, has run dry, if you've been living on reserves and you don't have a deep enough well, you need to retreat to the well and dig it deeper yourself. So that when people come to you for water, you can say like Jesus did, hey, I've got something better. And just like she said, she said, oh, what do you mean? You've got something better than this water that ja from Jacob's well, our, our faithful forefather? And the people who come to you might say the same thing. Oh, what do you have to say? Something better than what I just read on Facebook? You know, what do you have to say? Something better than I just read on the news this morning? And we can say, yes, we do. We do have something better to say. Something that transcends all of that noise. When the Samaritan woman comes to the well and Jesus says, hey, I've got this living water, she's still nervous. But yet she, in, she's intrigued. And that's all we need to do is intrigue those who come to us. We can respond with wisdom like Deborah. We can have courage like Esther. We can have faithfulness and dedication like Daniel. And Jacob may have provided his children with physical water in an arid land, but we need to remember that Jesus provides his children with living water in a spiritual wasteland. And that's what we carry. That's the message. So what am I saying overall? I'm saying overall that the only thing that will transform our nation is the gospel. And so we need to make sure that we are supporting those who know that. That we are, we are uplifting ourselves, we, like we are emboldening ourselves with the spirit of the gospel. We are encouraging our church leaders and we are encouraging anyone who's representing that voice at the moment. When Nebuchadnezzar was needed um, help from his nightmares, he wasn't looking for an intercessor. If you look closely, he was looking for somebody that he could trust. And if you look at um, Daniel... 2 verse 9 he says if you do not tell me the dream this is what he's saying to all the other um, wise people of the day and he's desperately trying to find an interpreter if you do not tell me the dream so not only is he saying can you just interpret my interpret my dream he's saying no if you if you're really good at this like wisdom stuff you would know the dream i had i wouldn't need to tell you 
And why is he saying this? So let's have a look. If you do not tell me the dream, there is only one penalty for you. You have conspired to tell me misleading and wicked things, hoping the situation will change. So then tell me the dream and I will know that you can interpret it for me. So he's saying, no, I don't trust anyone. If I have to tell you the dream, you could just say whatever you want for an interpretation and then I have to trust you. No, I'm looking for someone who already knows my dream because then I'll be able to trust them. So if we go down further, down to um, verse 20, uh, Daniel's gone and slept for the night and he himself has had a vision so of the dream. So he's basically dreamt the same dream. God's like, here's the dream. And then Daniel proclaims in praise, Praise be to the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. He changes times and seasons. Amen. He uh, takes kings down and he raises them up. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in the darkness. That's such an uh, awesome praise and prayer for today. And if we skip over to, um, just to prove that the king was looking for, for someone he could trust, if we skip over to verse 45 at the end there, the king says, uh, oh, sorry, um, Daniel says to the king, the great God has shown the king what will take place. So he's already given him the interpretation. He said, this is the interpretation. He lays it all out and he finishes by saying, the great God, so my God, has shown the king what will take place in the future. The dream is true and its interpretation is trustworthy. He's telling him, you can trust me. The interpretation is trustworthy. And that's what people are looking for now. I love the fact that people have lost um, trust with the government. I'm with Rob. I'm excited. Great. I'm so glad that you don't trust your government anymore because suddenly you're asking, where do I put my trust? I'm so glad that you are worried about the vaccination, that you no longer trust medical science because you are, challenged, you are asking the questions, what happens after death? What happens to me? You know, in general, the public are asking these great questions. You know, the harvest is ready. I'm having amazing conversations with people at the moment, even in the political arena, who have been working in government places for decades, and all of a sudden, they don't like the government. <laughs> they don't know what they're doing there. This is a great place. I heard someone say to me the other day, it's so hard um, to bring someone to church. Like, oh, the hard part about, you know, sharing the gospel is trying to get them to church. I thought, what? That's where you're going wrong. Do you know how easy it is to share with them the gospel now? You don't have to drag them, bring them anywhere. Just share with them the gospel. You know, I, there was a time, I'm sure, where it was much easier to get someone to church and then they hear the gospel through the preacher. No, we're not there now. People are ready to hear what you have to say today. So on that note, I just want to end with um, my last story. Does anybody know Tom Tate from the Gold Coast? Okay. <laughs> of course. Now, when Tom Tate was running years ago, I was um, campaigning for somebody else against him. Now, I um, hate to be crass, but Tom Tate came out on national news and his ultimate goal for the Gold Coast was, he said, I want the Gold Coast to be, and this is his words, the boob capital of Australia. So if you want to get your surgery done, you come to the Gold Coast. This is a business opportunity. This is how we will build the Gold Coast. That was, that was him on the news. Okay? This guy was so far from God. And so I was backing um, another Christian man and really supporting him. Now, ironically, what took place is Tom Tate got up, he won the election, and I've since no longer have a relationship with that person. That situation, unfortunately, ended not so well. And what transpired after that is the true hand of God and the influence that we can have in our community. There was a church leader known by Sue Baines who got alongside Tom Tate and refused to go away. And she backed him. She was a pastor. She backed him 100%. She said, my church will do for you anything that you want, anything. And so he thought, oh, wow, I've got this church at my, my advantage. I can do whatever. But he didn't understand yet who's greater. 
And the church continued to pray for him and open up opportunities for him to come and speak at the church. They would put bre prayer breakfasts on for him. Now, Sue did something very clever and she got in contact with my pastor at the time. Now, that's Len Rosso. Len Rosso had been working for 20 years to build unity across the body of Christ on the Gold Coast. 20 years, that was his heart. He actually stepped out of pastoring so he could focus just on building unity. When Sue was able to reach Lynn, then all of a sudden they had every church on the Gold Coast working for Tom Tate, praying for him. He gets radically saved and then he declares we need to celebrate Easter as a community on the Gold Coast and they put on the Easter celebrations at the council chambers. And at the first Easter celebration at the council chambers, he says, I want to be baptised in front of everybody. And he did. <laughs> Isn't this amazing? Yeah. His wife then passes away at an airport a year later. All he could do in that moment was pray. And so he did. And she was raised from the dead. Wow. Then he declares in the newspaper, front page of the bulletin, God raised my wife from the dead. And so I don't want to limit God to the small things, you know, and, how, and what we see is right or wrong. All we have to do is make sure that we are heard and we take up our rightful place in this space at the moment and to be bold and to stand strong. So thank you so much for having me today. I feel really special and really honoured to be here. Um, I love the Underhouse Church. The best church I've ever had, ever been to, was in the red dust of Arnhem Land, surrounded by feral dogs, <laughs> and in at night time, 10 o'clock at night, under the stars, under God's handiwork, no building, nothing, with broken speakers and all sorts of things. And so, you know, be encouraged, guys. This is, this is a new day. Thank you very much. Amen. Let's just pray for Kimberly. Lord, we just thank you for Kimberly, Lord God. We thank you for, Lord, the um, walk that you've um, given her to walk. And Lord, we just thank you that whenever we take up that banner when we never take up that challenge lord you provide everything that we need lord even while we can't see ahead you're already making a way for her and preparing her and we thank you for the testimony we thank you for her her strong faith in you lord god and that she will stand up even if she's the only person in the room to have a different voice and lord we just know lord god that um the difference that she's making and going to make so we just pray lord god that um lord that you will uphold her lord that you'd even put um an Aaron and a her, Lord God, to hold up her hands, Lord God, when they get weary and and to um, and we just, Lord, thank you, Lord God, that you know even that the the enemy um, will you know fire attacks, Lord God, that they'll they'll just go off. Her shield of faith will just be held up, Lord God, and they will just have no. Um, um, They'll, they'll have no effect, Lord God. And we thank you, Lord God, that you said that our, our weapons are, are, are not um, carnal but mighty in Jesus Christ. And so we just thank you, Lord, that, um, Lord, you go before her, that to everything that she needs, you will provide. And, Lord, I just pray for everyone here, Lord God, as we um, bring this message today, Lord God, that whether it be prayer, whether it be standing up in politics, whether it be sending emails to our politicians, Lord, that we'd be moved to have a voice, Lord God, for you, Lord because when we don't stand up, Lord, we're allowing others to have their voice and then we're subject to whatever those decisions are made. So we just thank you, Lord God, that so many people are now rising up as they see it's our opportunity, Lord God, to bring, um, Lord, your kingdom on this earth in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. Amen.